happy to. Uh, I have somebody here today telling me he's about to. So take it away. Uh. It is four o'clock. All right. Uh, so, my name is Sabi Silai. I'm over the other side, right? The safe department. And uh, talking about uh, a model I'm working on on building the uh, on modern spin spiral of this compound, this alloy. So this is manganese gold, right? And interesting properties that are related to its magnetism. So I'll kind of build up on how we right? And if you don't hear me, just because I have a small voice, <laughs> right? <laughs> so the outline of the presentation is this. So I'll do some background on uh, the physics problem, and then explain a bit more about what the exchange interaction is and how it exchange parameters then how the actual model works and what we do when we get to gold itself. All right, so first though, before I start, I wanted to just give a brief background, right? So a brief, a brief introduction on what different approaches, approaches are when we work with uh, data science and material simulations because, uh, you know, recent, if I can say recent, developments in data science, it's become very useful to start and apply those methods in material simulations, right? To speak. And one of, so it's essentially, or basically two things. You have databases and machine learning algorithms, and those are for, you use them mostly for more efficient filtering. So if, for instance, you have your different structures and properties and you want to look for some specific ones with some specific tendencies, you know, databases, you have a collection of the different materials with their structures and properties and all this. Kind of use the different algorithms to kind of sort through that before you, instead of, you know, going through the whole thing like they used to do, right? And you also have this, uh, other approach which is evolutionary algorithms these are mostly for optimization right so for a structure or other properties that you have and uh, so we have so this is a large database so if you go on there you have almost every material and they have their electronic uh, structures uh, their density of states and everything you can think of to do with that and this here is a database we are building up so with uh, dr papa right so it has a bunch of materials and it has to do with the equilibrium structures and the density of states and the electronic structures of different materials so from you know single materials to alloys or so binary systems to triple systems all of those yeah. first about these databases so yeah. are the databases the results of experiments or are they some kind of initial calculation of the uh, So this one that we have, these are ab initio calculations, so semi-empirical calculation, not exactly ab initio, and ab initio, so a, a combination of the two. And the materials project, I think, has both. So you have both experimental and some calculated properties in there, right? So in my project, though, I'm not using I'm, I, I'm trying to kind of create a database, so I'm not using a lot of machine learning or evolutionary algorithms, but I'll get into it once I get into how the project is working, right? So, uh, all right. <laughs> okay, it's all right. Uh, so this, that would mess up a lot of equations. Right. Just uh, run on board? Yeah. All yeah, oh, right. Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> we think that that, that supposedly makes sense. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, that, that makes some sense, right? So, uh, but uh, it, this is, I thought this was a good point to start because it is, it, it, uh, 
meshes into something that um, a lot of data scientists are familiar with, right? So this is a Q-state post model, right? You have interacting sites, right? And they have a number of spins that they can take. And uh, you have your coupling constant, so the strength of the interaction between those two sites and a magnet, an external magnetic field, so outside forces that affect how those interactions happen. And here you will actually have, so this, so you have your interaction here and then this is your spin up and spin down or like, so this is the spin that you're interested in, the site that you're interested in, and these are the neighbor sites, right? So, and they take some specific values depending on your Q number. And so how they interact, or rather how you determine whether to change a spin or not, right, depending on the interaction. So is this probability that we have. Right, so you compare the between two states and uh, if, so this is, what is this called? This, what? No, so this is essentially the basis of our, so we, we'll be using the Monte Carlo algorithm, Metropolis Monte Carlo, and the comparison between the probabilities of the energies that a state or a site can take is the basic. So how that works is you pick a random site, give it a new spin, check how it changes the energy, and then you either keep it, keep that energy, or revert back to the old energy depending on uh, whether that new energy is lower than your previous one, or if it is not, have this probability. So you you get a random number, and depending on that, you ask. And on that and this difference between the energies, you assign a new spin, and then keep your cycle going, right? So this is the basis of or more simulations and uh, some interesting quantities that you look at when you do this is uh, you have your specific heat which is essentially the variance energy and you're also calculating the magnet magnetism so that also has some variance and the spin autocorrelation or the magnetization autocorrelation to tell you uh, how the step size between which you need to take your samples if you're averaging for statistically sound calculations, right? Can you go back to the, the, the algorithm? Yeah. And uh, concerning the performance of the algorithm, yes. I mean, it uh, works with conditions, but is it the case that in the vicinity of some kind of phase transition, it doesn't really convey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah so this is why we look at this uh, autocorrelation thing, right? So I, I'll go into it later, but uh, so precision, you have a lot of, your variance increases greatly, so you have to check what the correlation is to kind of vary the number of uh, steps you're taking when you get close to that. Right? Uh, okay, so this is what I was saying. So this is what I think called... Uh, the segregation model, right? Or something similar to it, right? So you have different people, if I may say that, right? And then you assign them uh, some, uh, whether they like their neighbors or not, and you run your simulation with some parameters and then they, right? So in this case, so you have, uh, so this is the post model and the Q value in this case is three. So you have three possible values that a site can take, right? So let's say one, two, and three. And at a very low temperature, you have this congregation of the different sites at, you know, different places. And when you increase the temperature a little bit, then it becomes almost homogeneous, right? Everybody takes kind of the same value. And if you go on a little bit, so this is at the transition, right? Uh, 
at the midpoint and you have it almost randomized and then at very high temperatures in this case it becomes completely randomized right so i'll go into what all those mean as far as the magnetization is concerned but how you check so uh, when we do our simulations the point of interest is the transition itself right so how is the transition happening when it's happening and what can you do to kind of play with how that works how that transition works and how you find out where that point is is by looking at these variances right of the energies and the magnetization so the heat capacity and if you look the peaks here so these peak i think there's there's three of them and they correspond to different interaction parameters right so if you look at the peaks of these variances you can kind of see where exactly the change takes place, takes place from a homogeneous arrangements to a, a more randomized one, right? And uh, again, so this is the susceptibility, the variance in the magnetization in this case. And you can also see how when you change your parameters, it affects how the transition happens, right? So if I'm here, so if I have very large parameters, you see it's second order right and as you reduce your parameters it comes to almost a first order transition right and again so you can check exactly where that transition happens by looking at the peak in these susceptibilities yeah oh first order transition is if it was a first order transition we'll see a jump Right, so it'll be here, then immediately go down, right? And second order is kind of smooth, right? That's the only difference. Okay, so now into the actual physics that we do, we are the origin of, so this, where you have everything aligned, is called ferromagnetism right and where you have your randomized spin system is paramagnetism and in some materials you have them spontaneously aligned at low temperatures so like is a ferromagnetic material and at low temperatures it becomes magnetic so ferromagnetic spontaneously without any Thing else so the cause of that is this the exchange interaction right so that is defined as the difference in ordering between parallel and anti-parallel spins and that results that difference in that energy between the parallel and the spins results in that spontaneous ordering so what is that uh, you have two atoms, hydrogen atoms. So a hydrogen atom has one single electron and one single right? So if you have two atoms, you have two nuclei and two electrons, right? Interact. And they can interact in a couple of ways. So the first one, so this is spin up and this is spin down, but the orientation is opposite, right? And total spin in that case. So plus a half and negative half is zero. So this is uh, and asymmetric. So this is called the asymmetric interaction, right? And in the other case, the symmetric case, you, ha you have three additional possibilities where they both spin up, so you have a total of one, or they're both down, one is up and one is down, but the orientation is in the same direction so in this case so those are the possible spin interactions that you can have the difference between them so i can calculate the energy for the asymmetric and you calculate the energies for the asymmetric cases and the exchange interaction comes only when 
you have this difference, right? So if 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 the the energies for the two cases are the same, then you don't have any spontaneous ordering or for that to happen, you have to have this J difference, right? And in cases the J value is positive, you have your, your ferromagnetic material like iron. In the other case where it's negative, you have your antiferromagnetic, right? I'll, uh, so this is ferromagnetic. So everything is up in the same direction, and this is antiferromagnetic. So opposite spins right arranged in that way and uh, of course these so the other condition is that you they cannot occupy the same space right the fermions so they follow the exclusion rule so if you have one space you have one electron in there right now once you get that so we, we started with a two atom two electron system right and that has that energy and it was generalized to a many electron system which is how we end up with our heisenberg model right so from a two electron system you expand it to your many to many electron system and that leads us to the 3d heisenberg model so in this case instead of just spin up and spin down your spin can take any direction in the 3d space right and the and you also have an exchange interaction that is specific to that can be specific to each pair and is symmetric Right, so if one interacts with two, that, that that interaction is the same as two and one, and you have your magnetic field. So the total energy here is just the summation of that interaction between the neighbor atoms and the external field effect. So in most uh, simulations, this is set to zero. Right, it simplifies things. All right, so before we get into the actual simulation, so how do you verify or know that you're kind of doing the right thing? So that goes back to your main field approximation, right? So uh, this essentially is, uh, it's been solved exactly for a 1D case. It's a bit complicated when you go to 2D and once you get to 3D, it's, you don't want to do that. Right. Uh, so for the so uh, just to check that we're going the right direction, I uh, this is a summary of the solution for the two D case. Right. So your magnetization, you have a self-consistent equation here. So you have magnetization, and uh, it's again magnetization. So it's interacting. Uh, so the beta here is uh, a factor of the temperature. Right. You have a factor of the temperature and the magnetization and that will give you what the next magnetization value is supposed to be. And if you, again, so you set your external field to zero and you can simplify this, right? So the hyperbolic tangent, so it's just, if you know your series, right? So it just takes, you end up with the, just this expression here. And right at, so if, for instance, you, you have uh, your this ferromagnetic case, right? Everything is aligned and the average in that case is one, right? So right at that position point, you can sort of calculate what the J value is supposed to be, or you can set, like, you can find out what the transition point is supposed to be when you set your M and then do your approximation with a weighted J. So this paper kind of goes over those. Yeah. Could you go back to your um, graph of the, the pictures of the... Mm. So uh, how many configurations then can the material take on? Does it follow like something like the exponential Boltzmann? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's... Uh, 
it can take so like here i'm saying this is antiferromagnetic but there's a bunch of possible antiferromagnetic configurations right so it can be so you have this one and then that or this can all be aligned in the same direction and then what distribution, what distribution? How many configurations are oh i'm not i'm not sure i think it's how i can you count that so there's There's a certain number of configurations based on how many atoms are there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, what, how, what, what shape, what form is that? Um, I haven't really thought about that. Yeah. But if you have, so you have your 3D case, so that's a lot of configurations. Which is why, uh, so the, the more configurations you have, the more accurate your calculations will be. So one of the things I'm trying to do, right, is to, to create a database of configurations and then calculate from that. Uh, okay, so all this uh, approximation. Now, if you think about the 2D case, uh, if I set my uh, to two, right, uh, to two, so the, in a, on a two degree, you have four neighbors, right? So my Q here is four around. Is it four or two? But, uh, your critical temperature for a two degree will come to around, uh, yeah, in reduced units if you're running a simulation. So I, what I, I from, so this, this is, uh, my initial distribution. So, if you consider like a distribution of uh, initial spins, right? So, you want them, if you reference them from the same point, you want them equally distributed on the on the surface of a sphere, right? So, what I do, I take this and then restrict it so that my model becomes Ising-like, and then a two D list, right? a 2D grid and see whether the Heisenberg model that I have will reproduce the results for the 2D Ising case since I know what the approximate value of the critical temperature in that case is. So this is a check kind of on uh, whether the model gives the correct And here I want to say that uh, I set it up so that my model doesn't really care whether the output is 3D or 2D. So you just generate a list and then it runs with that. So that really makes things convenient. And it does give, you know, the expected results. So I'm saying that's okay. And uh, I do a simulation. So this is just with arbitrary exchange parameters and you so you initialize things randomly so i reduce the size here so it's better it's easier to see so you initialize your random configuration and then at low temperatures you have your ferromagnetic arrangement and then at high temperatures it goes to it goes back to the randomized configuration and uh, the energy and magnetization curves also they behave correctly and <clears throat> again you see so from the correlation time which is uh, the autocorrelation you see that at the transition point you actually need to take more steps right or like sample between uh, more steps to get a better st statistical average of your simulation these are all the results of calculations, right? Yes, yeah, so uh, I, you, you run this model, right? So you put in some arbitrary parameters and you check the results, whether you, you get a transition at some point and uh, how that looks. So you expect that both the energy and magnetization should have a peak in their variance at the same point and the autocorrelation time should increase when you get to that transition point 
And so once you once you're all set, then you can set your model to increase the number of steps when you get close to this transition, right? Okay, so how do we determine exchange parameters for actual materials, right? So we do that from first principles calculations. What first principles calculations means essentially you are starting with uh, just the structure, right? So whether it's a BCC or uh, body, body centered cubic or FCC or some other structure and the lattice constant and some other, a few other basic properties and then you, yeah? Oh, BCC. BCC is your basic uh, 3D grid. So if you have a 3D grid and you have points on it, right? Like uh, this, let's say. So the points on here are changed in a regular periodic lattice structure, right? So this is BCC. There's no, like you don't have anything in the center. It's just eight points on the corner of a cube and then that heats in the different directions. Right. And it, for other structures, it becomes a bit more complicated, but essentially it's repeating from a basic structure. And uh, the first principle takes that basic structure and with the lattice constant and then does some calculations for like the total energy and the states are getting to what that is and the electronic structure for those materials. And the thing about this uh, first principles calculation is that they are very expensive so you don't want to do your calculations based on them although like over the years uh, many years ago actually so in this series, they came up with this density functional theory which uh, optimizes uh, answers from the, the conscience it reduced the amount of calculations that you have which is possible now to actually do the computations that we do as fast as we do them, right? And uh, there are also additional options like the tight binding for when you get to larger art, larger model sizes. So tight binding is it's a lot faster than the DFT, but but this is it's a more what you call semi-empirical uses some information from DFT calculations to start calculations. But, and uh, what we do is we use packages that have been, uh, that use this, the different DFT approaches and I'm mostly using this quantum express, the initial calculations. And then we also have this NRL LAPW that was developed here by Dr. Papa and uh, Dr. Mel. Right. So I also use those and these are commercial. So this is open, open source and uh, these are commercial. And the Quantum Espresso is essentially the open source version of the VASP, right? Now, so how do we do that fitting? So uh, you have your, so this is what I'm talking about. So calculate. So uh, it's a very basic approach. So I'm, I get configurations, right? A, a number of them. And I calculate their energy using, again, these packages, right? And then I kind of fill it out with uh, the number of neighbors and then break that down and then do a maybe to get what the parameters are supposed to be. So you, uh, I think I'll go up to maybe 10 nearest neighbors. So if you have a site that you're interested in, the first neighbors, then the second neighbors, then uh, as it goes like that. So this kind of turn that way and this extend down that way, right? So you have your database of energy and extract your parameters from that. So this is what the setup for ion would look like, right? So you have a couple of, 
configurations. So I'm just showing a few here. It's like, uh, you, so this is antiferromagnetic as well as this, right? And they're both different from the one that I was showing before, right? And this is ferromagnetic and this is non-magnetic. And when you do your calculations, you come up with a table like this. And so you have your nearest neighbor energies and the total energies and from those interactions, you can determine what the first and second exchange parameters are supposed to be. Now, I start with iron because iron is very well studied. So there's a bunch of information about iron and we know that its critical temperature is uh, around a thousand Kelvin. And the parameters that I get actually bring us pretty close. So here, when I run a short simulation, so this is for a small system size, but I have larger ones. Uh, I get pretty close to that experimental value for the critical temperature of, of iron and was supposed to be. Now, uh, so I also try to reproduce what other people have done, right? But uh, say, for instance, in this paper, they kind of, I think this, this was one of the first one where they did a Monte Carlo simulation of uh, iron using iron parameters. But this, so I use smaller systems and I kind of get uh, close to the transition point. So there's something called a finite size effect. So as the smaller your system is, the further away you will be from the actual point where it is. So if you see here, so this is like 2000 and this is 500. So as I increase the size, I'm getting closer to the transition point here in reduced units. But to be to, to kind of uh, be true to this experiment here, each point was uh, simulated for about 8 million steps, right? And uh, they do a serial calculation so that the final configuration of this point is uh, the initial for the next one, so that takes a while. And it's, I think they use around 4,000 sites, so that, that takes a long, long time. You say takes a while. Yeah? What do you mean by takes a while? Time. A while, uh, so if I do it on our computers, so each point will take maybe a day to run. Yeah. Uh, just uh, this uh, normal desktop that we have, right? Yeah, yeah, one core, yeah, so on one core, right? So uh, uh, there's ways to parallelize it, so I'm trying to implement those too, right? Yeah, but it to kind of reproduce what we're doing it's is very computationally intensive and expensive right okay uh so that's my model essentially it seems to be working so the next point will be to extend it to the manganese gold system right which is uh, the point of interest and why this system is interesting is that the manganese gold, its transition the, and the nature of the transition can be affected by pressure and voltage, right? And if you are able to do that for thin films or thin film manganese gold, then it has potential for application of electronic devices, right? Uh, this paper by uh, Dr. Glassbrenner, who worked on this, is it considered, uh, like I said, uh, once the Heisenberg model, once you get to greater than two dimensional cases, it becomes almost impossible to calculate. So, but in this paper, they did a one dimensional case with uh, four nearest neighbors to kind of see what the properties are. And so they did these different calculations. And what is uh, pertinent here is that different people have observed different transitions 
and different conditions for the same material, right? So it's phase transition. Is it first order? Is it second order? Is it in between? Is still not resolved. And if we can model that, kind of make that definite and then try. And uh, you also see that pressure affects the spiral angle. So what, the, what that means is this. So manganese gold, as opposed to right, it has this, if you look at the way the spins are arranged, right, they have an angle between the layers and they form a chiral. Right. And I've, we've done some calculations with Dr. Glassbrenner. And uh, so this is your material. So you have, it's a kind of tetragonal structure. And the only, the magnetism actually is due to the manganese gold. Gold is inert, right? So if you look at this, so the gold is a, a bit higher here and most magnetization comes from the manganese down there and uh, so this is a plot of the density of states right and you have a spin up and spin down electrons look at it you are able to see so that the magnet the total magnetization of this system because it's essentially uh, if you sum Part and the bottom part, if it was non-magnetic, you would end up with a zero, like a straight line. But because of the magnetization of the manganese, you have resultant magnetization for the whole system, right? So it's not zero. It's and uh, yeah. So what he from the calculations that that Dr. Glassman did so. It's uh, the first four neighbors are important in this case, right? For the manganese, so we are not when you do your we're not really considering the gold because they have no effect on the spin, right? From here, uh, we're just looking at the manganese itself, and the first four planes are important. So when you do your calculations, you look at up to four nearest neighbors, right? And uh, it's transition is between the first and second orders, right? So not exactly smooth, but not a step from one phase to the next. And the angle itself can be tuned with pressure or introducing different materials in there, right? And uh, that pressure can you know, make the transition go to second order or right? So here, just to summarize, kind of, uh, the manganese gold is interesting because of its susceptibility to pressure, right? So if you change the pressure, so in this, by changing the pressure, I mean changing the interaction parameters, right? Like we saw in the initial slides, right? So when you change the interaction parameters, it changes how the transition happens, right? So in this case, when I say when you model changing of the pressure is essentially playing with the parameters to see how that affects the transition. And again, this system has not been modeled yet. A lot of calculations have been done on it, but it hasn't really been modeled to see what happens. And we don't know whether in the bulk state and uh, in the thin film state, that same behavior will be observed, right? So that's and if we can model it, then it's possible to have it uh, used in spin electronic devices. So I have done some work on the model, right? So check that it works correctly and produce some other work. And uh, I'll, uh, I'm adding uh, handling for finish size effects. So as uh, your system size changes, you get a uh, different transition point and but there's ways of handling that so that you get the correct point and then you also have to calculate the parameters for the spiral of the manganese gold and i've also done some initial calculations for you know density of states and all that using the quantum espresso and this is what it looks like so again this is non-magnetic 
right? So I've set the spins to zero, and this is ferromagnetic. So in the non-magnetic case, again, you see that the up and down, they sum to a zero, and in the other case, and the contribution to this magnetization is mostly due to the manganese in the system, right? Mm, yes, that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm looking at it because they did do a Monte Carlo simulation. So the only reason was to prove that it was... Yeah, so you, I think when you build a model, so the first thing you have to do is uh, show that it does work. And to show that it does work is you have to reproduce other work. So yeah. 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 So uh, a few things are different. Uh, they don't quite give. So they they use a different method to calculate their parameters and all this stuff, right? Yes. But this is not the only one I'm doing. So there's other a few things that I'm trying to reproduce. So if yeah. you add pressure, it affects the spin system? Yes. So does that make it cheaper to form magnetic material because you can pressure rather than have to use something else to make the material magnetic? Is that why you're interested in that? Or yeah. Um, the, you've heard of this thing called Moore's Law, right? Mm -hmm. So like electronics are getting smaller. And when they get smaller, you have uh, problems like if they're, especially if they're based on electrons. Right, it becomes more difficult to effectively transport the electrons across the surface, right, for you. So, but if you are able to manipulate the spin instead, right, say using pressure or temperature, changing the temperature, just the electric field around the material, then you don't have to think about electrons yourself, right? So I, that's why. So it's interesting that that system, this uh, the spiral system, because uh, the so uh, work electronics work with uh, the binary system zeros or ones, right? So if you look at where is it? Right. So if they are all aligned, right? If you can align pressure or temperature and align all this, you have a one, and then if you change that back and it goes back to your spiral again, that's a zero kind of. So moving that and then how that, because if it's a second order transition, it takes in between the one and the zero, right? If it's a first order, then it's one and zero. So figuring out how those parameters affect that transition again. Yeah, so the phase transition, uh, you know where it is. Yeah, the, you know where it starts to change, but how does it change? You can get that from experimentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yes. So my, my question then is, is that um, what's the advantage of MCMC simulations? Why not just uh, experiment and, and see what the shape is? For thin films, I guess, yeah. it's a bit more difficult to do those experiments, right? Yeah. Because when you change, and also uh, when you get into the nanostructure levels, iron does not behave like iron, or things behave differently. They have different uh, electronic structures, they have different reactions and all this. Yeah. So one thing we see when you showed the uh, two-dimensional representation in, in some of the transitions, yeah. uh, one of the things you did 
much about the problem you can shoot if he's like, um, right, can you go back to the, to the, uh, we'll go back one or two more maybe? Ah. Uh, so yes, here. This. Yeah. Uh, Actually, forward one is better. So it, it, it is known. I think uh, I mean, in a variety of fields, both mm. physics and that's matter, but also in, in this, you know, what we do with computation, that is useful to compute things like what is the size distribution of the domains, and those and as you go through the transition, right. uh, those domains become uh, they they become they they take on a power law shape, that is, there would be a few mm. big domains and lots of little ones. Right, right, right. That, uh, so one way that I think Gene Stanley in particular, mm. that research group, is used to study the different kinds of transitions, what sort of second order or something else, yeah. to look at the nature of the domain coarse grain as yeah. you go through the transition. So to collect statistics about the, about the domains, like they're probably hard in three dimensions. But yeah. So there are, I know there are ways to automate it in uh, two dimensions. Yeah, so... What, what we have right now, so for this, we had, you take like a random site, so a single site, but there's, there, there's, a, there's a different approach, like you say. So instead of just using one site, you use that clustering algorithm. That also is kind of speeds up the system, but for the 3D case, it's a bit not easy to implement, right? Yeah. Do you do any work with, with show computing what is size distribution of the domains and how it evolves? No, no, I haven't gone into that yet, no, no. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, thanks again. Okay. Do you have any questions?